very good morning everyone i welcome you all to this morning session which is a webinar hosted by epsco i hope everyone is keeping safe and healthy during these critical times of covid-19 pandemic why is it recording again that's okay that please continue sanjay sure so welcome to the ongoing series of epsco hosted and conducted webinars in which we have had eminent speakers from the industry speak on variety of topics related to library tools mental health and balance and so on something is going on There's nothing. Please continue. Uh, we can hear you. Sure. Topic of the webinar today is evolution of discovery. Our users often tell us that uh, over the last decade or so, EBSCO Discovery has established itself as a brand in the markets worldwide, as the customers have loved it uh, wholeheartedly because it solved their problems to a great extent. Rather than resting on our successes, we have been constantly listening to our customers to help evolve it. even further based on the valuable feedback of our customers today we have mr mike mackinnon as our guest speaker mike works as a director of saas innovation with epsco for asia middle east north africa and oceania mike has been working in the technology area for more than 15 years with 12 years of those year 12 12 of those years in the library industry he was an early team member of proquest summon and in tota products and an original contributor for plum analytics in the research analytics and engagement space for the past 3 years mike has been focusing on epsco built and saas partner solutions consistent across all his roles mike has had the challenge to work on with the new new to market services and currently folio is the first micro services platform in the library industry and mike has been involved in the development and go to market plan for folio from scratch not taking much time further i would like to now invite mr mike mackinnon to take us through the evolution of discovery in this session uh, over to you mike all right thanks sanjay and hello everybody hopefully you can all hear me just fine um i agree with uh, sanjay's opening sentiments um during this really unprecedented time with a global pandemic you know i know at least for me uh, this is the first time that i haven't been actively in markets and on the road uh uh for the longest time I, and now probably about 3 months for me versus you know 10 uh 10 years or so being on the road so uh a pretty new time for all uh, and for uh everybody who's attending remotely please you know stay safe um uh wear masks follow uh, uh any guidelines that you've been given um definitely stay safe for you and your families So uh as has been mentioned the intent of this session is to talk about what uh, uh evolution discovery has been happening at least the activities within EBSCO we've been investing a lot of resources around as Sajay mentioned around um gaining feedback from our customers and from uh patron studies um doing some actual patron testing which is great um and then uh uh taking that feedback and and building tools around that or um even just say updating existing uh toolkits that we had as well um we're going to go through a lot today so uh i apologize uh for the speed of things but there's definitely a lot to cover um and what we'll do is we'll put questions back towards the end and i hope to be able to to take as many questions as possible so uh keep your questions coming they're good we'll just get to them towards the end Okay so uh first things first as mentioned we have been engaged with a lot of our patrons particularly doing not only uh proactive surveys around uh um particular verticals so whether that's in the academic space corporate space uh or medical space we've been uh, looking to see how patrons engage with our um uh tools or SaaS tools in particular whether those are say e-host databases and how they're getting access to content or if that's discovery services like what we're going to be talking about today your a to z list your linking tools um doing a lot of things about uh heat map monitoring as well as um as i said surveys around what activities work best for them so 
um, a lot of engagement with patron behaviors, and then also taking all of the feedback that EBSCO's had for years and years and years about what librarians need and trying to kind of co-mingle it too as we look to build better um, both searching experiences with discovery services and access um, uh, downstream from, from discovery too. So with that feedback here, I'm gonna start talking again pretty quickly. Here's uh, what we've been focused on of late. So as you already know, uh, EBSCO is uh, working with a lot of um, uh, authentication toolkits in the market. You know, principally you've got um, uh, proxy services, whether that's uh, easy proxy or remote access uh, for, for your markets in, in India, um, but also beyond just say proxy tools. So SAML, if you, you didn't know already, SAML with uh, the secure access markup language is the next evolution of authentication tools. Uh, librarians need to be looking at SAML support systems this is where NISO, the uh, National Institute of Standards, uh, has been driving publishers uh, and content providers is towards SAML-based systems. And even outside of the library, when you look at authentication platforms on the whole, you look at, say, Google's OAuth, um, you're trying to get away from simply supporting proxy. IP is not secure, it's not private, um, and Proxy services in general have a lot of bandwidth constraints. So think about we're all with uh, having big spikes in remote access because of uh, COVID-19. With those spikes of remote access, we also have proxy services that are still a bottleneck. So um, we're trying to get to services that use SAML because SAML keeps tokens embedded for the user in their browser rather than having to go back and back and forth between proxy services that become bottlenecks so we support um, lots of saml based tools not only say uh, enterprise tools your your organizational enterprise tools but also the only saml based authentication tool for libraries uh, ebsco's uh, premier partner for open Athens. so uh, this is something that's been uh, definitely uh, on our radar for a long time we've been working with open Athens for for a long time but growing authentication and the ecosystem for access, that's something we continue to really strive to do. Uh, so coming up, uh, what you may see in uh, some marketing uh, material that's coming to you or the EBSCO teams uh, specifically talking to you, we just launched the Google Scholar CASA integration and the UCASA integration. Uh, CASA is basically the ability to get access when I'm on campus uh, be a proxy where I never even have to log in. If they come into Google Scholar and they find uh, an article they want, because your collection, you're in IP range, well, we want to just pass that user right through to the content because they're in IP range of your institution. So we know that you have those collections because uh, EBSCO works with Google and we, we make sure that your collections are available within Google Scholar and we can get them accessed that way. Uh, UCASA, Universal CASA allows uh, an even broader access point than that, um, and we can touch on that in more depth in, in another session if you'd like to. But we're just really trying to get better access for patrons uh, with the Google CASA and UCASA rollout that just happened last month. Um, other new things with authentication, uh, this Find My Organization is coming this month. It should hit about mid-month this month uh, in June. And what that'll do is when you go to, say, an e-host database uh, or you come into EDS, if you don't, uh, if, you're, if you're not coming in through your uh, institutional web page, say I'm just coming in from the open web, um, I can go and find my institution and find my organization. Um, so kind of a waif of where are you from and identify which institution that authenticate that way. Uh, so that's nice to see. Um, ORCID will be later in the year, as well as um, uh, Autho platform support, and that's for the Facebook uh, Baidu, uh, which is like Baidu Scholar for um, Google Scholar. Um, LinkedIn, I think, is probably going to get pushed a little bit, but Facebook and uh, Microsoft support are definitely going to be there. And then uh, also looking at WeChat at this point, uh, which isn't on the list, but it is there too. Um, I didn't touch on the LMS integration because I actually want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, LMS integration is big on our radar. We want to make sure that um, uh, access for our faculty members, for the ability for them to take 
collections, uh, or, or sorry, objects in the collections uh, that our libraries have and use that within the curriculum, we want to make sure that they can do that easily. So uh, EDS, the EBSCO Discovery Service is LTI compliant. That rollout will happen this month uh, where I could be a faculty member, a professor of say biology, and I could go into um, Canvas as an LMS platform, a learning management system platform, and I could add items to my course. So here I am in Canvas and I can go into my um, uh, syllabus or even my outcomes page and uh, a modules listed in here. So for those admins who are um, administering your Canvas portal, you want to go to your modules and make sure the EBSCO discovery module is added. But once you add it, as I'm searching for objects in my uh, collection, I could do a search query across an EBSCO host database or EDS. And now I can actually add these items right to my coursework. So um, it makes it easier for faculty to use libraries collections at the point of need and then easier for students who are being driven to the learning management systems to be able to see those items that the faculty have added and then make use of them without having to go do a, a, a generic search at the library or go ask reference desk staff uh, at the library itself for some assistance. So this is just a, a real easy, simple way to make sure that your collections are being used um, in your, your coursework. And this, the LTI compliance is not just limited to Canvas, by the way, this is a Canvas integration, but um, any LTI compliant uh, system, so your Blackboards, Moodles, et cetera, those, those will all work as well. Um, also new on uh, our rollout that's just happened is a new A to Z list interface and platform update. So uh, that's our publication finder service is our A to Z list tool. And we really tried to do two things with it. One, we tried to make sure that it had a nice modern looking UI so that patrons who use it like what they see and they find it easy to access collections. And then we also at the same time wanted our librarians to be able to search uh, uh, as an information specialist, whether they're searching by specific subject areas or they're searching by specific areas of their collection like database searching, we wanna support all of that. Um, so I grabbed a couple uh, screenshots and pulled those in um, just to show you here, uh, rather than do this live, I could do this live, but um, uh, here it's just easy to walk through it. Here I'm in uh, the A to Z list and I could easily type in a search query and start getting to the individual titles I have within my collection or I can do some pre-filtering based on what I have loaded into the EBSCO knowledge base about my institution. So if I only have uh, in my collection uh, journal content, then obviously I wouldn't have anything in books. So it depends on what I put in my knowledge base. But once I put those in, I can now easily filter across those resources as I'm doing my search. I don't have to do that at a later then I could do it even before my search query began. So I'm trying to make it easy for access. Um, these filters, these drop-down filters, real simple and easy to use. They're clear uh, for me to see. And uh, again, for our information specialists, it might get us right to exactly what we need, whether that's an ISSN, um, or if I even know what particular publisher might be that's not necessarily in a database, but I know which publisher it is, I could browse by that if I wanted to as well. Um, most users, patrons, are not going to be using a whole lot of Boolean, but again, our information specialists do. So we're trying to meet both needs uh, with this rollout, and uh, uh, the new publication finder certainly does that. So this is here in searching for publications, my titles, but I could actually go and browse by subject area, and you'll notice the exploding is the term for it, the exploding subjects where they expand out to show uh, uh, additional details in the hierarchy, or I could browse by uh, databases as well. Um, and I actually think that's the next slide. Um, you'll see here too the uh, uh, drill down within title searching for A to Z. So if I know exactly where I'm heading for a title name, it makes it easier for me to get there. Um, of course, I could just type in the title name as well. Both will be responsive in, in Publication Finder. Uh, yeah, and browse by database too. So here I'm going to scroll back down and, and click right into a database. If I actually wanted to see which titles were in that database, I could click a uh, database and then it'll dig into the title list underneath that. 
So if you are already using uh, EBSCO services, our full text finder for a link resolver, um, there, the access for publication finder is included in that subscription. So uh, this is something you already have access to. If you're on an older version, then you could get upgraded to this. There's, there's no cost to that either. So this just got rolled out. If this is something you would like to get moved to, uh, please reach out, uh, out to our staff and we're happy to, to switch you over. Um, we are not going to do a full switch, like an automatic switch for all libraries. We want to make sure that uh, libraries want to move to this, uh, this new UI and not surprise anybody. So um, if this is something you'd like to do, let us know. Uh, and if, if you don't have uh, uh, our A to Z list, but you do have a growing e-resource footprint, um, I would recommend you reach out to our teams and we'll talk to you about uh, that maybe being the first step into providing a, a, an A to Z resource for your institution. Um, the other things we've been doing, we, we've been doing a lot of mobile work. So not just things like responsive design, which is uh, all of our tools, including the publication finder I just showed you is responsive, but actually building a mobile application. So the real question is who has gone to their iOS and downloaded the new uh, EBSCO um, uh, application from iOS or from Android, either one. Uh, there should be an app in both stores and you should be able to uh, go ahead and get access to it today. In fact, uh, I probably should have pulled this up first, but there's my app, it's probably hard to see. Um, but yes, you uh, the application is there in the store today. And when you uh, download your app, you'll go and you'll identify your institution. And from your institution, you'll be able to get access to whatever EBSCO databases uh, they have within their subscription. So the app is for eHost. Um, and then if your institution has the EBSCO discovery service as well, you'll get additional functionality in the app. So it's not a separate app, same app just additional functionality in the EBSCO discovery service over sites or, or institutions that only have EBSCO databases. So a little bit of a, a separation there, but some good robust functionality in both. You'll be able to not only search across your collection, uh, do some filtering within there, be able to uh, email or save items to a particular folder that you have or send them to your account for, for use later. Um, that's usually the activity you're going to do on a mobile anyway. You're not going to be necessarily looking for citations or uh, drilling down and, and absorbing, say, full text within a mobile. <clears throat> you could, but uh, you, you generally wouldn't be doing that. You're doing it to come back to later. So uh, a lot of robust tools around the EBSCO mobile application. So go get it. It's there today. Um, some screenshots in here for you today. Uh, I kind of like showing it on my phone if I can, but uh, some screenshots for you today. As I said, when you sign in, you'll do some searching first to identify your institution. As you're searching, you can use some of the filters uh, to uh, distill your search down to more finite items. <clears throat> it does have all of the search um, um, functionality that you would expect. So um, autocomplete, uh, autocorrect, and it's gonna depend on you know, collections that you have from a discoverability standpoint and whether you have EDS or it's just EBSCO databases. But the basic functionality for searching and uh, discovery and access of those resources is going to be there on both regardless. I already mentioned those. Uh, so when I find a, a search result that I like, um, notice that it highlights for me which terms uh, were my search query and where were they found? Were they in the full text or were they just in the title? I can click into an item and I could actually get to it. So if I did want to read, I mentioned this, you can do this. But most of the time you're actually going to save this or cite this item or send it to yourself and have it uh, uh, be something you open up on a later on a full um, uh, desktop application. <clears throat> um, improved in this as well, it's not just for article content, but it's for books as well. So if you get a lot of ebook content with EBSCO, um, this will be a really improved platform for viewing that. Not only because do you get to see, say, your uh, license restrictions around your books, and you could say, how long do I get to check this out for? Or, um, or maybe this item's already encumbered. I only have a single use uh, user license, and so I can't get this. But then I could go and engage either with uh, staff, or I could look for a different item, and I could do this all from my mobile. So real nice, easy uh, experience for uh, patrons, regardless if it's article content or, or book content. Okay. 
So that is mobile. That is new A to Z list. That's uh, some improved uh, front end that, as far as feedback goes. Um, and now I want to take it to some video uh, implications. So we are doing a lot for how patrons access and view video. We know this is a massively growing area and has been for some time. Uh, but library services in general and even library publishers, say like Jove, um, they have some great uh, tools embedded in their um, um, either title or, or database, depending upon the provider. Um, but it, they have some tools that are embedded there, but they generally haven't distilled down to discovery services. So what we've tried to do is improve our distribution and access of video content within uh, EDS. So if I'm doing a search in EDS, It's like I almost got disconnected there. Hopefully I didn't. Um, so if I'm doing a search in EDS and I'm seeing some video here as a result, um, I can not only, so here we go, so I'm seeing some video in a result. So when I click on an item here, you notice I have my typical uh, institutional collections, my articles and books, et cetera. But if I click on an item here, it'll actually take me to that item directly or coming back here, if I click on view all results, it'll launch a new video viewer where I can see the items that are just videos um, listed in that same, uh, they were there in the um, uh, call out. It, it will end up sh expanding that and showing you just the video collections. And so maybe I wanna see just you know, the first 10 seconds of each before I get into uh, individual items. But I can click on this and this now will actually take me right to the video that we've loaded in an easy to use player. It's not gonna take me out if it doesn't force me to, again, depending upon where we're getting these videos from, the publisher restrictions around license and access. But for anybody that we can bring those videos right into our platform, uh, we're gonna do that and be able to deliver an easy experience for the user so they don't have to go from one tab maybe to the next tab as they're uh, looking for, uh, say, an item for a project. Uh, okay, so natural language, um, NLP, this is a natural language processing, is a big growth area for not only discovery services, uh, but it's a big growth area for how users find content. Um, we know that our general patrons are not information specialists, they're not librarians, they, most of our users are undergraduate uh, um, uh, patrons. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can find scholarly material that isn't necessarily um, using controlled vocabularies or uh, any authority uh, control within those records. Um, and we're actually finding uh, with natural language uh, objects that are still very relevant and scholarly in nature. So <clears throat> the example here is a UAV for an unmanned aerial vehicle or uh, we've, we've seen other terms like AI for artificial intelligence. So those types of NLP support, what we're doing on the back end is we're doing a lot of correlation of one uh, uh, NLP, a natural language term, and we're mapping them to the authority terms from our subject indexing. So if you didn't know, EBSCO spends a lot of time uh, working with subject metadata. Now we have relationships with publishers that we've had for 70 years. And so we'll have content indexed uh, from general databases as well as say your, your ANI databases. So we have a lot of authority subject metadata. Well, what we do with the NLP is we ingest tools that are open that contain uh, uh, NLP terms and we map those terms uh, via rules to uh, different ontologies of the subject areas that the query is actually in. So some of this is just machine learning where we use machine learning to map out different areas. And some of it's our actual um, taxonomists that work at our headquarters office and they do a lot of editorializing of uh, metadata that we receive from publishers and we map it to these uh, NLP terms. So <clears throat> what we're, when we take all this data and we do this mapping, we're able to actually expose items in the collection that may not otherwise have been exposed. So uh, here we've got a search query for change blindness, and you can see that our change blindness is coming up as we would expect it to 
in, uh, in any search metadata. But if I come up here and I expand that, it will actually show the correlation between uh, uh, authority control records, um, oh, sorry, control vocabulary uh, metadata and the NLP terms that are being uh, searched against. And we'll do this in a visual search. I'm actually gonna show this live. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it here, but it's really some pretty fun work we're doing around mapping of subject metadata to um, uh, regular normal language. Um, okay, so what's next is new uh, user interface designs for EDS. And I have this here because I wanna really um, frame the discussion around the new discovery service with timelines. And that is that um, the new EDS UI, so if you're an existing EBSCO discovery service customer and you have access to EBSCO discovery service, there is a new UI that is rolling out um, in the next six months or so. So we're, our target for it is the very first of next calendar year. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to look at customers that want to work with us, um, especially first, where we can uh, go ahead and implement and we don't necessarily have to have a bunch of uh, custom work that needs to be done, but instead we can roll out the new UI and we could see what the engagement is with you as a library and then see if we need to adjust anything um, moving forward for libraries that do need a lot of custom work. So I wanted to make sure that I, I set a little bit of framework around timelines for you here. But that said, everybody should be really excited about the new UI that I'm going to show you. So here's just the snapshot. And instead, I want to show it to you live. So can everybody see my Chrome web browser? Yes, Mike. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. While that loads, this is a, a live shot of our new publication finder as well. So if I wanted to browse some collections here, I could do that too. Should be loaded now though. Okay, good. Okay, so um, uh, here I am. This is a sandbox for the new EBSCO discovery service. Now, um, again, there's no additional cost for you if you're a library that already has the EBSCO discovery service. If you're not, and you've been looking at, if you're not a subscriber currently, and you've been looking at maybe getting the EBSCO discovery service, this is a great time to jump in because now what you be able to set up your knowledge base, so what your collections are, and then by the time that the new year, the new calendar year comes around and this is available, you'll be ready to go and be able to jump into um, offering a great new experience for your patrons. So you saw what I did as I signed in. And one of the first things to notice by me signing in is that I have a personalized session. So while my name isn't Tim Lowell, but our sandbox reflects me as a user that it knows, which is great. I have a dashboard and we'll get into the dashboard in a little bit. I'll have the functionality that my institution has provided in these sections on the left. So some of these links take me to functionality that we know libraries want to offer. So our A to Z list. And then I'm gonna show you in a little bit our, our fun concept mapping search. This is really where a lot of that natural language processing comes into play. But these links down here, this is all custom. This is whatever the institution wants to provide. So it could be something about coronavirus, or it could be something about um, a new program or a new collection. Whatever you have that's important to your institution, you could do a call out a highlight item there. Also notice I can pre-scope my search before I even have to run a search. So maybe I really wanna look for something that's peer reviewed and I know that I do. Maybe I don't want any physical material because we're all working remote due to coronavirus. Maybe I just, I just want to do that. So I'm going to type in uh, discrimination and you'll notice I get autocomplete and I get suggestions. So it'll give me suggestions about what it thinks that I'm looking for based on global search query data in EDS. So I'm going to search discrimination. 
and I get my results. Now here's my results down here, but I also get in what's called an exact match placard. It tells me, hey, there's an actually a title, a journal called discrimination. Is that what you're after? Or did you just want items in the collections that have to do, have relevancy about discrimination? I also get this research starter here. So if we know for a lot of users, they don't have a lot of understanding about what they're searching for. They need more context. They need more information. And so this is an encyclopedia entry that tells me what is discrimination? And maybe that's what I need to read first. So a little bit of call out there about what's happening. Now, if I scroll down, I can see I'm looking across collections that are both E. So do I wanna read this ebook now? And P, they're print, they're physically on the shelf and I'm getting my real time availability. Is this on my shelf? Well, if it's on my shelf, I can see that right here. I could click into the details. I could get everything about this object. Um, I could save this item. I could like it. So here I'm liking it saying, yeah, this is a good item. And maybe I want to save this. So I'm gonna add this item to a project. Well, I have, remember this is personalized up here in the top left, right? So in my dashboard, I have projects. Well, I can see my projects. I've got urban planning, I've got hydrogen fuel cells, fracking, nothing to do with discrimination. So this is a new project. I'm gonna type in discrimination. And I'm gonna say this is due in six weeks. And we'll say it's uh, my social sciences project. And click create. Now this item not only was saved, but it was also created in my new project. So I had already saved this item. Now, if I just simply wanted to cite it, I could bring up citation tools. Um, it gave me a lot of flexibility about what citation formats and styles I'm going to be using. Maybe I want to export it. So it makes it really easy for me to use. Copy that to the clipboard, et cetera. Um, and maybe it's an ebook that I'm after. I could click into the title and I could see details about this ebook. Maybe I really just wanted to download a specific chapter or I wanted to view a chapter. So I'm gonna come into one chapter. Notice this launches me in a new tab so that I don't have to repeat any search experience. This this uh, expectation, this is based on feedback from, from patrons. So expectation that it launches me in a new tab and it's gonna bring me to my item, but not lose anything that I've just done. Hitting back button is worse now than just closing the tab. So we wanna make sure we're fulfilling that promise for access for um, our students. Not sure why that's timing out for me there. Um, let's go ahead and let's actually just read this item as a whole. So here it's bringing me to the item. Oh, did this actually resolve on the chapter yet? Nope. So it's bringing it to the item. And you know, as I scroll through this book, I can come down and view a specific chapter if I wanted to. It takes me right to Brown and Board of Education. I could download this if I wanted to. It tells me where I'm at in the whole book. Real easy to use ebook viewer, right? This is a major improved experience on browsing and using ebooks. Okay, so let's say I like this ebook and I'm gonna add this to my experience as well, my project. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this. Remember discrimination was a new project we added. I'm gonna add that now. Great. Okay, so now I have a print book and I have an ebook and I could go to my dashboard and I could look at my projects. If I wanted to see all of them there, if I wanted to see maybe liked items that I've, I've read before and I'm not necessarily creating a project around it, but I liked what I read, I can keep a liked list here. Um, but I could go right into my project and it will show me the objects that I've added to this project. Now, as due dates for the timelines come up, there's an alert system that will alert users to say, hey, letting you know you've got a timeline on this project coming up. Is this something that's important to you? And remember, all of this is LTI compliant. It integrates with your learning management tools like Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, et cetera. So a real nice, search experience as it relates to other tools that the library offers students. Okay, now remember I'm searching discrimination here. I could come back and, and rework that search, but I actually wanna just go to the concept map. If I click the concept map, 
Concept Map will take my existing search query and really try to drill down in what I might be looking for. So here, am I actually after discrimination of unfair treatment of persons group based on prejudice or bias? Well, I'm presenting tonight from the United States, and there's a lot of um, uh, discrimination and racial tension happening in the United States, lots of protests. Um, and um, it's something that's definitely top of mind for all of us here. So this is, you know, very um, uh, current. I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, I want to know more about discrimination. So I'm going to click bias, racial bias. That's what I'm interested in. Well, if I find something here on racism, um, actually, before I do that, Notice that I can actually search this around. This is our 2D search. This is as this subject area relates to other subject metadata that is indexed uh, in the EBSCO index for EDS. So from indexing all of these publishers that we do within EDS, we can look at records that have this subject term, uh, um, discrimination, and of all the records that also contain to discrimination, what other subject metadata do they have? And I can make these correlations. Now, if I wanted to do this in 3D, I could switch this to 3D. And I could move this stuff around. I kind of like the 2D a little bit better. So for me, I'm going to come back to 2D. I'm going to grab racism. And yes, I want to do discrimination plus racism. So I'm showing the relationship of racism to discrimination. Uh, racial segregation, yes, that's relevant as well. Notice the Boolean terms over here are anding these together. I don't necessarily need uh, anti-Semitism um, or uh, um, Russophobia, but I do want affirmative action and prejudice. Okay, great. So this has refined my search sum for me. Well, now what I can do is I could click into any one of these. Um, and I will just so that if I want to go in, I can click expand and this will go just right into behavior and will help me continue to define. But instead, what I actually want to do is I want to come back to EDS based on the refined search from relationships that I've solved for. So remember, in my first search of discrimination, I had 8 million hits. If I come back to this, I had 8 million items in a result. So it's a really general search query that doesn't really tell me what I'm after. And instead, after using the concept searching and after some anding that our patrons don't know how to do Boolean operators, so we're helping them. Um, so after anding these concepts together, I am now down to 65,000. And I haven't had to do any filtering yet. I could even come up into filters, say I want peer review, say I want a specific date range of publication, a specific area where it might be focused on. So if this is the United States, because of all of the stuff that I mentioned for my project, um, I can apply these filters and now I can get that 65,000 down to 1300 records. And this is a much better result set for me to start using for my project. So now here I am, I'm in a peer review article. If I say read now, notice this is invoking a link resolver. If this is a Wiley, this uses a, um, a, a link resolver that will take me to Wiley. Or if we have it available in PDF, I can just click on the PDF and it will get me the PDF right there because we have that indexing relationship and license of access with the publisher we're getting it from. Or maybe this item's even open access. So I, I have this object that I can get and I'm right into the PDF. So a huge improvement on usability uh, patron functionality, there's just a lot of stuff there that really does, you know, again, based on feedback from patrons, really does solve for the needs of, of patrons and their um, searching and access. Okay, so that's discovery, and that was our A to Z list, and that's concept mapping and our natural language processing. Um, some of the other stuff that we're doing is we're trying to make sure accessibility it's also something that doesn't get, um, not necessarily forgotten, but doesn't get um, as much attention as features do, right? Accessibility is very important. We wanna make sure that users, regardless of um, any constraints they may have um, or disabilities they may have, that they can still get access to what libraries offer. 
So not only do we have APIs that come as part of your subscription service, and so your local teams could build tools if they wanted to, uh, not use uh, our own stuff. Maybe you have real custom needs, you wanna build it, but you want the data behind it. We have APIs that come with that. Um, but we are also building in accessibility tools directly into EDS and, and EBSCOhost with the new platform. Things from being able to tab through a results set and have um, a voice reader come back and read back where I'm at in the page as it's going. Uh, we are meeting our, our ACA and WK uh, 2.1 compliant, um, and we are working with uh, uh, screen reader services uh, for centers of the student centers for um, uh, services, uh, Carol Center of the Blind, gosh, I'm forgetting the name there. Um, so we are working with uh, patients that have uh, special needs as well. So lots of focus for us on not only are we providing a feature rich experience with a lot of scholarly metadata, especially all that subject work to solve for natural language terms, but then doing it in a way that everybody can get access. And just the last two slides here, they're not really focused on discovery, but they are focused on something that is, uh, you know, uh, very important to EBSCO. And, and that is that we're really trying to provide tools that are open source for libraries to be able to use. The, there's um, a lot of um, strain on library budgets, particularly around COVID-19. So the more we continue to invest and partner with open source tools, um, the better for libraries and uh, you know, uh, library patrons because they'll get better services out of it. One of those tools is Folio. If you don't know about Folio, uh, there's gonna be a session coming up. There's even a slide here a little bit later about who's going to be doing it, um, Neil Block. But there is going to be a session on Folio and uh, Folio is um, a fantastic tool that does today. You could do ERM management today, your electronic resource management today. You can do your print management today, your circulation, your users' check-ins and check-outs, your bibliographic uh, editing of, of MARC records. You can do all of that um, today and your e-management today. It's all there. So um, I, I do think it's really important that libraries pay attention to Folio. Um, if you aren't sure what that is, you know, please ask and we're happy to, to expand on that. Um, uh, I do have a couple slides in here on Folio. I suppose, I suppose I'll say this because I, I think we have a couple minutes. Um, the thing that makes Folio really different is that Folio is a microservices based ILS. So think about your your library services platform, your LSP, right? Uh, usually it's Koha, it could be something else uh, that you have, but you have this very print, uh, a traditional functionality ILS. And most libraries have bigger e-collections or growing e-collections more so than their print. So e becomes this thing that's managed on the side because the ILS in general is built from 10 years ago or more. Well, Folio is built on microservices and it's built for E as well as P management, both. So when you deploy your own Folio instance, not only will you be able to do E management and P management, but you could choose which applications you want to be deployed in your tenant versus other institutions may have different applications because their needs are either bigger or smaller than your own. They, they have different needs, so they have different applications. Well, Folio as microservices, just like our, our mobile phones are, Folio as, uh, as microservices allows for an underlying operating system to be separate from the applications that run on top of it and gives you more choice as to which applications you want. Um, and it's, this is something that's really empowering to libraries. It's really important for, your, for libraries and librarians. So, in a nutshell, a little summary. What did we cover? We covered new video experience, which is great. Um, the users can, can browse and consume videos without having to, to navigate out of their search experience. A single sign-on, big improvements for authentication and access. Not just your proxy support. Yes, we, we support proxy, of course, uh, for access to EBSCO content. But from a services and a system standpoint, of course, we support that as well for integrations. But SAML, S-A-M-L, Secure Access Markup Language. 
If you are not using a SAML based authentication tool, you definitely should be. Um, knowledge graph and the search enhancements, that's that concept map searching and natural language processing. So mapping our um, natural language to subject authority metadata. That's what that was. Uh, that's really gonna be ongoing. We're gonna continue to index more and more resources and content and do more and more mapping, but there's a lot of stuff that's already done uh, today. Mobile app is already launched, go get it, it's out. Um, but it is ongoing, so we'll continue to do sprint releases for it. Uh, uh, fantastically enough, the mobile app actually consumes the EDS API. So all of the new features that we deliver on the EBSCO Discovery Service get delivered in the EBSCO mobile app as well. Uh, find my organization is coming up at the end of this month, just a couple weeks. Uh, Google Casa, UCASA complete and done. So users get better IP access to content. EDS API, the new EDS API for the new user experience that I showed you. The API will be done in August. The new UI will be available in the beginning of the year, beginning of 2021. January is our target. Um, LTS. LMS compliance uh, for learning management system integrations, your canvases, Moodle, Blackboards, those um, are all gonna be done at the end of this month for EDS as well. Uh, and the others I already mentioned. Oh yeah, and Folio, of course, can't forget Folio. So if you don't know about Folio today, uh, come to a webinar we're doing in a couple weeks on it. And that's it, I think I, Right on 45, 47 minutes there. It should be good. Yes, Any Mike. Questions? Thank you so much, Mike, for uh, completing in well in time. And uh, we have a lot of questions. I'll take as many as we can in the stipulated time duration. Uh, let me just uh, pull out my questions here. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so uh, how many databases can we add into the discovery tool? There's no cap, no limit. You could add databases that are tracked in the EBSCO knowledge base. So the EBSCO knowledge base has a bunch of publisher resources that we've um, indexed content from and, and created databases around. You can even load your own collection. So if you have institutional repositories or custom databases for your own institution, you could load those as well, plus your own uh, bibliographic holdings data for your print records too. So all of that is uh, available to be indexed and discoverable in your uh, EDS instance. Right, Mike. Next one is, uh, you mentioned about enhanced video experience. What is the source of these videos? Where does the EDS pick these videos from? So right now, a lot of our new video platform is actually being delivered in AWS. So we're hosting these new videos in AWS. Uh, EBSCO has been doing a lot of work about migrating specific platforms, uh, not only from our own data centers, but putting them into AWS Direct. As far as where we get the videos from and how we host them, it depends on the publisher and the resource that we've got them from. So if it's in the public domain, I think the one that I showed there was the Associate Press. So it's in the public domain. It's something we can bring into our hosted video uh, elements in AWS. If it's something that's not, and there is publisher restrictions and license access, then it has to be, the user experience has to drive them to uh, the publisher's platform. So it depends. Right, thank you. Next one is, um, okay, this is one of, from one of our discovery users. So a relationship feature is very interesting. And please confirm, how do we get that facility? So the concept map searching, uh, it, it comes with the new EDS. So uh, there's no additional fee for you. It's just uh, we're trying to improve user experience. Um, so January 2021 is the target date. So bookmark your calendar and uh, make sure you email Sanjay after this and he'll, uh, he'll get you set up for January 2021. Sure, definitely. We'll uh, reach out to you, sir, and uh, we will talk about it and uh, as Mike said, Jan 2020, you will have this uh, feature most probably in our- 2021, Jan 2020 already. 2021, 2021, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, loaded into your EDS as well. Okay, Mike, the next question is, 
is proquest included in eds and can customize can be customized as per institutional requirement can it be yes. customized yes so we we um, do index uh, content if you're getting collections from uh, proquest license proquest where there's overlap we'll obviously have some overlap with other publishers and if it's a proquest exclusive or specific item then what we could do is we could still load a bibliographic record for that item so that you could still make it discoverable and then create a custom linking target uh, in a field that links them out to the ProQuest platform for it. So um, yes, you could discover ProQuest collections in EDS, no problem. Right, um, next one is, okay, this is just a comment and it says that I appreciate the way you have customized Stanford University EDS. The features are very much interesting. So just to make it available by default. Ah, interesting. So the Stanford EES, uh, they're using Blacklight, I believe, and they're using the uh, EBSCO API. So um, that's something that you could, Blacklight's open source. Uh, so that's something you could do at any time, really. In fact, I'd be willing to bet uh, if you have technical teams that uh, you could probably um, find a technical resource at Stanford and they would just share with you what they've done since it's open source. but you would still need to license the uh, EDS API if you haven't. Maybe you already have a, a, an EDS instance, and so then you get yeah, the The site API. has EDS already. Okay, good, so you have the EDS API then if you're already subscribing, then it's just about finding Blacklight and what did Stanford do, and then connecting the API. Sure, so it is doable, definitely. Yes. And uh, the next one is, when are you going to launch Folio? You just mentioned, you can repeat that again. Folio's, Folio's already launched. Uh, so I will say this, uh, the release in July, and Neil will talk about this in two weeks. Folio, uh, Neil's gonna do, um, he's one of our product managers for uh, Folio, and he's gonna do a presentation in about two weeks or so. Um, so I recommend you, you view that. But um, there is an upcoming release in July that is called the Goldenrod release. Um, and that release really represents what we would call, um, it, you know, on the product side, it's called MVP, which is uh, um, the base product that we want to make sure is code complete. So it has all the core functionality done, supports circulation, acquisition, uh, e-resource management, uh, finance integration, users, all of that stuff. As a core ILS, it would be done in this next release in July. There are two sites globally that are 100% live on Folio today. And they are using all modules, print management, circulation, user management, e-resource management, finance integration, uh, invoices and ordering. They're using all modules of Folio today, two worldwide. That's Chalmers University uh, in Sweden and then Missouri State University in the US. But most of the other sites that have currently lined up for Folio uh, that, that are intending to go live at Folio over the next 12 months, most of those are waiting for July, which this you know, is a, a month away. Uh, and the July release uh, for Goldenrod will be you know, what I would say is the go live point, really. Just one correction, Mike. Uh, Neil Block's webinar is next week. That is 16th. Okay, okay. there you go. Everybody should so come to that. Be, if, if you have an interest yes, in Folio, sharing the, yeah. If you have an interest in Folio, Neil used to be the CEO at Innovative Interfaces. He definitely knows the ILS space. He's been part of Folio since the beginning, and uh, and he's a good presenter. So come to that. Right. Okay. So uh, the next one is a little detail. I think it's from uh, one of our expert uh, library uh, professionals. I'll read it for you, Mike. Uh, there are a lot of tools of there are a lot of tools to access resources that is print and online, such as uh, ILM, ERMS, Discovery, Remote Access, Digital Repository, Open Access to Open Access, Open Data. Especially in India, users users confuse to choose the access mode. So, does any tool software that can integrate all the access mode to ease out the confusion of users? Is that so what, I guess what access stuff? mode? Are you talking about, are you just talking about open web, coming in from the open web? Looks like. So if you're coming in from the open web, you're right. Most patrons, particularly undergrads, um, you know, and even graduate students and faculty as well, they usually start in the open web. 
And then when they know what topic or they have a couple ideas about what they want to do, then they'll come to the library for more specific resources. But most of the time they start at the open web. Uh, so we definitely uh, want to support that. That's some of the reason for that Google CASA and UCASA work is not just to provide IP access seamlessly for content while they're on campus, but also because we think a lot of users are coming in from Google Scholar and Google anyway. So what EBSCO wants to do is be able to provide uh, your holdings data, you know, and you, you approve it as an institution. So it's not like we're doing it without you asking, but you, we want to provide your holdings data to Google on your behalf. So what you do is you go into your administrative console of, of EBSCO's services, and you have all of your databases listed that you've turned on and what collections and titles you have, et cetera. And then you click a little checkbox that says, yes, send this off to Google as well for us. And so then we send that data to Google on a regular basis to make sure that if a user is coming in from Google Scholar, that they can get access to content coming in from the open web, even if they're not on campus. Now, if they're on campus, that Google CASA, UCASA allows them to authenticate seamlessly. But even if they're not on campus, we still want to be able to highlight your institutional collections via coming in from Google. So then what they would need to do is just identify who their institution is. That's that where are you from support, that WAVE support. So look at my, find my organization, find myself, and then be able to get access that way. So we are definitely trying to solve for users coming in from the open web, as well as improved library tools. Right, Mike, thanks for explaining in detail. So I yeah. will just pull out the next question. Okay, how uh, EDS helps for deep search? Uh, so you can definitely do advanced searching EDS. I will say that uh, um, using uh, Boolean operators, controlled vocabularies, those types of things, of course, help. But users in general are not information specialists. So uh, using advanced search and filters where you're able to say, well, I'm looking for a particular author. So use an author field, for instance, or using filters to get to uh, specific publishers or publication dates or peer review or any of that kind of stuff. That's how we're usually trying to solve for advanced queries. I mean, that doesn't always work. Um, you know, they, they may put in search queries that they still need more refinement. So that's some of the reason for that concept mapping search that I showed you is that if even if you take a refined query and they come down to a thousand results, maybe from there, that's when they go into their concept map searching to see what other relationships should I be uh, uh, pinpointing in my, my search query. So we're really trying to provide more tools for users to be more granular, um, as well as high level understanding too. It's pretty fun. Yes. In fact, I wanted to share, there are some corporates in India who do deep search using discovery index. And also there are some medical institutions. Uh, they do deep search on discovery. Indeed. Yes. Okay, so uh, next question is, will the existing EDS user be charged fee for new EDS? No, no, no. Yes. Nope. Yeah, it's an automatic no, upgrade no. for the existing users. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not an automatic, you need to let us know you want the upgrade. We're not automatically turning you on for it, but you are eligible for it. All right, just okay. Us, just need to let us yeah. know. Yeah, we can explain the features, what is upcoming, and then you can let us know whether you want to upgrade on, to the new feature or no. And is the EDS freely available or paid? Yes, of course, it is a paid service, but we can set up uh, your institution by showing you a trial for a couple of months. And then if your users are satisfied, we can talk about how to implement it in total totality. I hope that and answers annual the question. Annual software as a service subscription. Yes. And uh, as far as uh, there are a lot of questions on pricing as well, uh, whether high or low, but I would recommend that people go to the e show Sindhu portal and uh, download the price list there. And it's been negotiated already by the e show Sindhu consortia. And I'm sure uh, it has been kept in mind, keeping in the interest of all the institutions in India. So the price has been normalized. Not to worry on that part. There are a lot of tools to access. OK, this I've already done. One second, if I let me see if there is anything more. I think, yeah, we are almost good with all the questions now. Okay. 
um, a couple, couple of more, uh, uh, Mike, couple of more, uh, just okay. a couple of more. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> just a basic question uh, from someone, what kind of library should adopt a discovery service? So generally the libraries that adopted a discovery service are uh, libraries that have pretty decent sized e resource collections. So anything from say um, six databases and more, um, or, you know, it depends, I suppose, on how many titles are within each database that you use. But if you have an e resource collection that you think is not getting used enough, um, Discovery services make searching across your e resources in particular easier than knowing what database to go use. Most patrons don't know, you know, one database from another. So discovery services break that barrier down. They let them search one search box for all of their content for all the e resources. That's how they're really uh, conceptualized at first. But again, discovery services aren't just limited to e resources. You could have your print. You could have repository uh, content in there. You could have anything really in the discovery service and will help you find those resources. So um, most libraries that adopt discovery schools or discovery tools are those that have uh, medium to large size e-resource collections and they want to make sure that they get more ROI, return on investment out of uh, the resources that they do license. Right, Mike, thanks for explaining that. Next one is a uh, couple of more smaller questions is uh, this is can okay. Do you see that in future we can have some local language searching facility available for EDS? So there uh, EDS does support uh, lots of languages, um, but I'll admit uh, some of them definitely are not 100%. So um, it's something that we continue to work on. And I know uh, in particular, as I mentioned earlier, uh, EBSCO has been doing a lot of Amazon web service migration from platform to platform from our own data center to AWS. And there is intent to improve language uh, internationalization and, and localized language support. Um, so that's just something we keep working on. We would love feedback from you if, if you're finding the experience with EDS from a local language isn't um, where you want it to be, we would love to partner with uh, uh, local institutions to try to make it better. But we, we currently support lots of languages. Right. Um, I'm just combining two questions last, uh, two questions into one. It is about features. Uh, can we have a feature of most downloaded or used article uh, for a particular keyword? Or, and the second, is, second part is, can we sort the results by most cited articles? Hmm. So there isn't a current sort by most cited. Um, that's an interesting thing. I can take that back to my product teams. Thank you for the question. Um, there is the ability in the EBSCO's uh, administrative environment to see uh, the most common search terms in both uh, a, an analytics dashboard, so you can see some data points. Uh, but also in, in a word cloud and in a list of your search queries were, and you could refine that over a period of time. Um, you could look at, say, um, maybe you have, uh, as semester starts, you always have the same type of search words come up. And so you could see over a period of time that these are things that you need to kind of solve for as a collection. Um, so we do help in that way. I think that answers both those questions, right, Sanjay? Yes, Mike. Thank you. Okay, um, so here we come to the end of this uh, webinar, and I'm sure uh, you know you all would have gained uh, uh, from the insights presented by Mike on evolution of discovery. If you have further any questions uh, further, you can uh, reach out to Mike or to uh, any of your EBSCO representatives who are in touch with you, and we can answer uh, back to your questions. <clears throat> Just a few updates, as you can see on the screen, um, the upcoming webinars is uh, this one is on Thursday. This Thursday, June 11th, how to publish with Oxford Journals. We'll be sharing uh, the link with all of you. And, uh, you know, it, it is also updated on LinkedIn and WhatsApp. It will reach out to you. Uh, the second part is uh, the 16th June webinar, uh, which is for Folio, uh, conducted by the guest speaker will be Neil Block. Mike, if you can uh, click to the next slide, please. Yes. So this is the first time EBSCO is presenting 
on a national platform uh, for all the audiences, a Folio, a modern op open source library service platform built to support emerging world. So this is something which is going to be a game changer. So please do attend this and share it just with your colleagues. Anyone who is associated with a library or an institution who uh, definitely value their libraries to grow. So Folio is something to watch for, watch out for, and please do attend this one as well. Uh, and we would like to thank you for your support for all the webinars that we have been conducting. I'm sure there was a backlog of uh, certificates which has been cleared off now. Uh, if not, then definitely uh, the software glitch which I mentioned earlier has been uh, resolved and you will be receiving your certificates of the previous uh, webinars, uh, which is uh, uh, if it is a backlog. And then also for this particular webinar, you will definitely receive the uh, certificates uh, when you fill up the feedback form. So thank you so much once again and have a good day. Stay safe and stay healthy. See you next week. Thank you. See you this week, in fact, and also next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot.